Welcome to our Garden America podcast. I'm Brian Maine, along with uh, Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco. Thank you, by the way, for tuning into these podcasts as we uh, pick a topic, a subject, and dive into it with a lot of detail. And today we're going to be talking about something everyone loves, I would imagine, for the most part, that is tomatoes. And you want to talk about them what, from seed, John, or what kind of approach do we want to talk about today when it comes well, you know, to tomatoes? You know, it's time to plant your spring vegetable garden, right? And from years of working in retail nurseries, uh, I think Tiger can attest to this also, <laughs> is that 80% of all the vegetables you sell are tomatoes. Yep. Yeah. If you want people, to be successful in this industry, put a tomato on your package. Yeah. <laughs> pe people who don't even grow vegetable gardens will grow tomatoes. Yeah. I remember as a kid when Billy Martin was managing the Detroit Tigers, um, you know, you think he, you don't think of Billy Martin as a gardener, right? And he grew tomatoes. Well, I mentioned that at the beginning of the show, I said something, a topic most everyone is into, and that is tomatoes, for the very, very reason with what you said, that even if you're not a gardener, don't grow much, you grow tomatoes. Yeah. Even if you don't have a plot of land, you'll grow one in a container. And it's just something about, I, you know, I'm not sure if it's people like tomatoes that much or if because the experience tomatoes of growing are so, so bad <laughs> yeah. that if you want a good tomato, you've got to grow it yourself. Well, and it, plus the stores only sell a couple of two or three varieties of that, right? If that, if that. And, and you know, right now it's funny because we mentioned this is the time of year when you start planting tomatoes. This right. is the time of year when you actually are, are in the infant stages of this, right? Yeah. But if you go on social media right now, everybody is posting pictures of their crops. Everybody's posting right. pictures of their plants and, and their fruit. And I'm like, that's not from any time recent because, you know, nothing is fruiting right now as yes. far as these varieties go. But that's how excited they are because they're taking information from years ago or past year and putting it up now on being excited for what they have. Because if everybody was posting pictures of what was truly happening in their you yard, wouldn't see much. it'd be like me. It'd be little two-inch plants yep. just sprouting out of the soil, and that's all they're doing. Now, but, if this is May, different story, right? Right. Yeah. They're going to have big plants yep. and fruit on them and stuff like that. Yeah, so, if you're in warmer parts of the country, you, you can put tomatoes in the ground right now. If you're in colder parts of the country, it's time to start your tomatoes from seed indoors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but now, what kind of tomatoes? You, you know, you mentioned that there were only a couple you could buy in the store, right? But when you're planting tomato plants or tomatoes from seed, you have literally hundreds and hundreds of varieties to choose from. And all with different tastes, too. I mean, it's a tomato, but... Colors, taste, yep. size of the plant, right. size yeah. of the fruit. Now, those that have bought tomatoes from, uh, from us before know what we're talking about because we always have several varieties. And then people, after a year, they, they pick their yeah. favorite. And the next year, they want to reorder that because they, they had success and it tasted good. A lot of tomatoes, um, there's modern tomatoes are coming out with better flavors now. But for the most part, if you wanted a tomato with good flavor, you wanted an heirloom variety of tomato. But... Planting heirloom tomatoes has problems because heirloom tomatoes were grown a long time ago, right? That's right. why they're right. heirlooms. Sure. And back then, there was no disease resistance in the tomatoes. So the negative part of growing an heirloom tomato is that if your soil happens to have soil-borne diseases like mm -hmm. fusarium uh, blight or verticillium wilt nope. or nematodes, you mm -hmm. can't grow an heirloom tomato. Unless you graft it. If it's grafted, the graft root will protect the plant. Yeah. Protect the plant. Which is the whole theory behind grafting is, right. a, is usually, a healthy rootstock that usually is resistant. double your crop, too. Yeah. But if you don't have those problems or if you're growing in a container, then you can grow any type of tomato. Make sure that you, um, when you're putting in your tomatoes, you've got to make sure that they're staked. If you have tomatoes on the ground, the fruit's going to rot, you'll get all kinds of mm -hmm. sow bugs mm -hmm. and things eating them and going into them. So you want to keep them up off the ground. So you need a, a steak. And you and those little tomato cages that you get. <laughs> $1.99 ones? Yeah, they're worthless. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah totally they really worthless. are. Uh, they're good for about a month of that tomato right, growing. Right, and then and the then tomato it, falls yeah, over. Yeah, And that's it. Right. Now, you mentioned something, though, that I want to, you know, elaborate on a little bit, is that, you know, if, if most people are going to have most success with, a tomato in a pot. I mean, you can put them in a raised bed, you can put them in a bed out mm -hmm. there in your garden. No doubt about it, you will be successful. But I think most people containerize their tomatoes. And you had mentioned something that I think people need to consider. And 
you're always going to hear that person that goes, oh, I've grown the tomato in the same pot year after year and never changed the soil. And, you know, that's fine. And they've been successful. And it's not to say that it's impossible to do right. that. But it's my not theory, recommended. Well, my theory is why take the chance? You've already either invested in time in growing this from seed and then you're transplanting it into a pot or into the ground. Right. You're going to invest all that time in growing it, which John had mentioned these diseases or these nematode problems. You don't see that until it's too late. Yeah. You know, After those, the fact. those results of that problem don't happen when it's a seedling and now you go, oh, I can start over again right away and start a new plant. Nematode, you don't see that until you've already starting to set flower, you're looking for fruit, and now it's too late to start a new plant or to start over again. So you've wasted your season because you just didn't want to take the time to do something the correct way. Well, let me, let's clarify that because if, if you have tomatoes in the ground, what is it they recommend every, what, two to three years moving them? Or not? They recommend every year moving it. Okay, well, the reason but... is that if you have verticillium or fusarium in the soil, it's there forever. It's not going away. So once you get it, it's not going to go away. That's why they recommend moving your tomatoes so that it doesn't start in the first place but once you've already got it you know it's too bad and so in a pot though you're saying every you year can dump it out dump you can it out dump out change the, soil, the soil start over again right. and it's a new start every year and i mean a bag of potting soil a good bag is 18 bucks yeah you know but you've invested so much in that tomato. that's what i'm saying 18 dollars yeah. is nothing when it comes to the time and the effort that you put into planting this plant and growing it out just to ultimately have it be you know diseased or killed by something you could have prevented. What kind of tomato am I, is the average person going to see at a grocery store? Well, I have no idea. I mean, what are they? What I mean, we know that the, the ones that they're we tomatoes. sell. Yeah, they're, they're just, just yeah. tomatoes that are, are bought. To, that You know, if they fall off the truck on the way to the grocery store, they'll bounce right back up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But the types that we would use uh, in the home, you know, you mentioned you think that most people grow – tomatoes in containers i would say probably probably that's not true mm -hmm. i think most people probably grow them in, the, in ground, the ground but most people around cities would would grow them in containers mm -hmm. yeah guilty and yeah. then then also in california where you have a lot smaller lots probably most people right. grow in containers but now there's a new tomato that's been developed a new line of tomatoes called super dwarfs and they're really stocky dwarf tomatoes that are perfect for container growth. Now, I think you grew one last year, didn't you, yeah, Tiger? Um, yep, I did. I can't remember which one, but I remember growing one. <laughs> Got eaten by the raccoons or whatever. <laughs> now, is your tomato family, do your kids like tomatoes? Oh, yeah, like? they love it. Really? Yeah. Good for them. Yeah, they love them. Yeah. God, I, I, that's great. great. There's, there's two varieties we can, you can get at Garden America. One is I get a rod red, and the other is Maori Warrior. And uh, those are two dwarf tomatoes. They're really stocky, and they don't need, uh, I mean, a steak's all you need. You don't need a tomato cage on those. If that, if you grow them in full sun, I think they stay more compact, mm -hmm. and they don't even need a structure, as yeah. you mentioned. One thing you're going to have to, if you do plant tomatoes, you eventually will get tomato hornworms. Oh, goodness. I had so many last and year. And they'll eat uh, all the leaves off your tomato, like, overnight. There's yeah, nothing so. like that, that instant when you spot one. And your heart kind of jumps because it's so, they're so big and ugly and scary looking. And then you go, oh, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. But those suckers are big and meaty. But you can protect your tomatoes by spraying with um, spinosad yep. or um, BT. BT. And you can, uh, and, and, and those as you are mentioned, organic sprays, you don't have to worry about poisoning your fruit. And you mentioned protecting it, you can do it before. You don't have to see right. the problem. Right. You can do this. I mean, when when do you think you would because you don't want to spray it on a young young plant no i i, I think that it depends on the weather mm -hmm. you know here in southern california they're they probably start coming out what towards towards june yeah like beginning of june you would yeah. start seeing them yeah right when you think everything's going really well right with yeah. tomato plant and you're going to get all kinds of fruit then yeah you start getting that then also you'll um you'll have problems with birds pecking at the tomatoes sure the birds aren't really eating the tomatoes they're doing they're pecking at the tomato for the moisture mm -hmm. so a simple solution to that is to put a bird bath nearby or put a uh, water for the birds to get right they'll leave your tomatoes alone 
Rats will be another problem, though. They'll go after the fruit itself. Too. Now, do um, the birds go after the tomato hornworm? Do they? Are no. they a little too big, huh? A little too big and meaty to yeah. carry that sucker They're as away. as big as some birds. I know. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. The birds get scared of them. Uh, I, they scare me. Uh, yeah. I don't like looking at them. There's yeah. two basic uh, classes of tomatoes, the uh, determinant and varieties and indeterminate. Mm -hmm. And determinant varieties are shorter. They grow to a certain height, like three or four feet. They stop growing and then produce all their fruit at one time. And that's what most commercial varieties, since you mentioned that, Brian, are determinant type tomatoes because they want to send in a picking crew to pick all right. the tomatoes. Right. They can't be going in every day over months to pick the fruit. So, uh, but most of the tomatoes that home gardeners use are indeterminate and they just keep growing and keep producing all season long. Uh, we have a question that came across um, from someone up in Oregon named Jason that wanted to know what variety of tomato you would recommend for up there along the coast. And there was one variety that came out this season, which we can't, we, we can't get that you had mentioned that was comparable to San Francisco fog, but better tasting cloudy day, cloudy day. So Jason, if you're listening, you know, look for cloudy day. We, we were able at one point in time to have it online right. sales, but we can't any longer. Um, but maybe you can find it up there in Oregon and is most a variety of the, called cloudy day. Most of the cherry tomatoes do well along the coast. You know, like sun sugar, sun gold, uh, sweet aperitif. Mm -hmm. They're they're fine, and the reason they do well is because they don't need as much sunlight and heat to ripen as other tomatoes do. Uh, also, Juliet. Oh Juli yeah, Juliet's an excellent, a, tomato a really good one. Coastal areas. Yeah, phenomenal flavor. So along the coast, you have cool temperatures, you have wind, and. Yeah. Uh, it's mostly the, the you know the, when we do it's mostly the cool temperatures yeah. and the in the cloud cover okay. that cause the problem. That's with the, the name of cloudy day. Sure. So what you're finding is you're finding a tomato that can set fruit with lower temperatures, mm -hmm. and you're finding a tomato that isn't prone to as much mildew problems, and therefore you're successful. Because like you said, if you took a a standard beef steak and you put it along the coast, not it's going to have mildew. Not and it's going to do well. It's never going to set fruit for you. Not it's not going to develop. It. Yeah, hmm. yeah. One thing to look at uh, if you're looking at heirloom tomatoes along the coast is to look for varieties that came originally from Russia. Yeah. Because Russia has cooler temperatures and the Russian tomatoes do really well along the coast. And you recognize their name because you cannot pronounce them. Exactly. <laughs> they always end with O-V. <laughs> well, some, uh. some sound Russian, but you can't pronounce. Like there's um, Siberia. Yeah. yeah. There's... Uh, uh, Stupichka yep. is a a uh, tomato that came Czechoslovakia. from the Czech Republic, yeah, Czechoslovakia, um, and that's one that does well. Um, it's trying to, some have Canadian names, like there's Manitoba. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but anyway, so think of those cold area named tomatoes. Yeah, it's because, associated because he, with he it. He said in his posting there is a variety that's named after the city they're in, and. But other than that, he didn't know of any other variety that would do well. And no. like you say, what city was it? I I can't remember. It's not up on oh. my feed right now. But San Francisco fog is another one. And yeah, uh, but it, we usually there's, there's better named. tasting. Yeah, Aptly you named. might as well just buy a tomato from the store because it tastes <laughs> as good as San Francisco. Right, fog. Exa right um, exactly. You know, we hinted on this though. Elizabeth asked a question. She has them in beds, and she has rodents that problems. And mm. you know, so so rats. Rodent problems for tomatoes are going to be rats, um, you know, possibly some skunks, but they're usually going to be digging in the ground for like grubs. grubs or things like that. Maybe a raccoon, um, you know, I and that's, but, that. but I think the big thing is Mostly rats. rats. And, Mostly I was gonna, rats. And, I'm, and I hate to say this, Elizabeth, because I have a rat problem in my own garden. And uh, aside from putting a structured cage they're gonna find a over way to get that in. bed, yep. they're going to find a way in. Bird netting is something that I've tried a number of times, and sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes it makes it more difficult to work with the plant. Um, but if you can build a structured cage over the net, over the bed, that's your best solution for a rodent problem in tomatoes. You know, tomatoes. people don't realize, I always say, when you walk outside, you're probably within 40 or 50 feet from the nearest rat. <laughs> they're, they're every, we walk outside here at the studio, with all the landscaping and stuff, yeah. there's rats out there. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're just very clever, very coy. We used to have, uh, when I lived uh, 
in the area of San Diego Alpine, we had a lot of tree rats. Yeah. You could see them running up and down the trees. I thought they were squirrels. No, they weren't squirrels. Uh, so planting the plants, we've listed some varieties. Uh, fertilizing. What's your suggestion for fertilizing, John? Do it. Yeah. Uh, stay away from high nitrogen fertilizers because you'll get a lot of green growth on the tomato, but you won't get much fruit. Mm -hmm. So things lower in nitrogen or in nitrogen. I usually find organic foods are probably the best thing to use on tomatoes. And in, if it's and in, in a container, I would use Osmocote because mm -hmm. you got a slow release. I still have some Osmocote. Yeah, Osmocote's great. You mm -hmm. should be putting that out now this time of year. I am. This is the time where everyone's going to get fed for your um, hibiscus. Yeah. And in, in you know, I recommend the organic and the Osmo code also for beds because that's the one of the things people say is don't plant a tomato in the same bed aside from the root, right, you know, right. problems, but because it depletes all the nutrients. And if you're using organic or slow release, you're never going to deplete all the nutrients. It's always going to be, right. there, you know, well, so, organite is excellent. For yeah. Vegetables. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and regularly. So even though they're slow release, Osmo code, I think says, is it a three month or is it a one month? And I know mill organites one month, but. You know, Osmocote is they have from three to six months, depending on which formula you buy. Okay, so but definitely on the middle organite monthly, you want to make sure you replenish it just to keep During it during the growing season. When just to warm, keep it right? fresh and keep yeah. it growing for sure. Watering, you do you are you one of those guys that waits till it wilts in between waterings? You or? know what? You know, I think Steve Goto might have told me this: the the tomatoes. You should not overwater, right? right? You should water them just when they need to be watered. And if you're trying to figure out how, how often that is, because you don't know how long, and then all yeah. of a sudden the plant's wilted. Right. And then you know, well, it needs water. It needs water. Yeah. But time, water it really good, and then let it wilt and see how much time that was. And now you know your watering schedule. If it was three days, then you know, okay, I need to water every three days. You know? That's a you know what that that's a good suggestion. Yeah, and as the weather gets warmer, it you'll know, have to water more often. And right. As the plants get bigger, and again, it, whether they're in the ground or, or in, in pots, in pots, so it's almost impossible to overwater. Right, as long right. as you have good drainage, obviously. Yeah. yeah. We should. So we covered the water. We covered the the. What tops. about just a few varieties? You know. Yeah, definitely. One, if you like sweet tomatoes, Brian, you and I like sweet tomatoes. Love we're, love the sweet tomato. We're not variety. big on the acid tomatoes. No. No. But uh, a cherry tomato that's the world's sweetest tomato is Sweet Apertif. It's a red cherry tomato that uh, rates 13 on the Brick scale. Previ and that one just recently came out. Previous to that, the world's sweetest was Sun Sugar, which rated a 10 on the Brick scale. I can't imagine because I've had the Sun Sugar with you. I can't imagine going from yeah. a 10 to a 13. 30 yeah. percent, yes. Yeah, that's like can that's candy. Is what that is. That's right. Dennis recommends you don't eat too many sweet aperitifs. <laughs> um, but so for cherry tomatoes, those are really good. For sauce tomatoes, there's um, most sauce tomatoes or paste type tomatoes aren't good for eating. They're just good for cooking, like Romas mm -hmm. are not really the best for eating. Mm -hmm. But San Marzano Ridorta, it comes from the Ridorta mountain region in Italy. That one not only can be used as a paste cooking tomato, but also can be eaten fresh. And then this year, well, actually last year, there was a brand new tomato that came out called Saucy Lady. And it almost, you put it in the pan, it almost just melts down into yep. sauce. Well, automatically. Yeah, and it produces a ton of fruit. So for sauce tomatoes, it's, uh, I'd recommend that. Then for slicing tomatoes, um, Big beef is a good one. Big Zach is the world's largest tomato. Mm -hmm. They'd be five, six pounds. So can Virginia Sweet, uh, which is one that's just recently been, become really popular. You know, Big Zach screams for a tomato cage. Yeah. 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 Need then, one of those rebar tomato cages. Right. Then uh, Aunt Jenny's Purple is an heirloom that's really good. Uh, other heirlooms like Brandywine, uh, Cherokee Purple, Mortgage Lifter. Are, are good. I and like then, that. Mortgage Lifter, that's a great name. Then there's a class of tomatoes that came out a few years ago that are elongated cherry-type tomatoes. And th they look kind of oblong, but great flavors. And and they're, the appearance on them is really interesting, mm -hmm. too. Some are striped, 
but Flush Tiger happens to be one of them. Green Lucky Tiger. T- Lucky one. Tiger. Like the whole Tiger series. Yeah. How can you go wrong with Tiger? Tiger, <laughs> Tiger, Tiger, Tiger. Yeah. So, um, yeah. oh, and then also I wanted to mention that brand new this year is a series of tomatoes called Cream of the Crop. And uh, there's a tomato breeder back in the Midwest that has been developing these hybrids, and they're phenomenal. Uh, Prairie Fire is one, uh, again, an elongated cherry-type tomato. And Red Torch, I think, got an All-American selection, Mm. if I'm not mistaken. But uh, those are some other ones to check out. And then there's a lot of striped tomatoes out there, striped, purples. Uh, Some people uh, are enamored with chocolate tomatoes. So anything that has that uh, uh, chocolate color to it have kind of a smoky flavor, and a lot of people like those. But there's there's literally hundreds, you know. Just find something you like right. and, and plant it. All Any right. uh, closing thoughts, Tiger, on that? No, enjoy. And, and you know, plant what you're going to eat. And like, yeah, exactly. like John had said, you know, find something that you're going to want to grow because uh, that's going to keep you moving through the season and being successful. And, you know, if you plant what you're going to eat, you'll take care of it. Where if you plant too much, right. it'll all get away from you, and then you won't have anything. And then it becomes a pain, and you yes. lose the interest. Exactly. Okay, that's going to do it. Uh, this uh, podcast, obviously, along with our shows, are archived on uh, Facebook Live. You can always go back and refer to them. Thank you so much for tuning in to the iHeart uh, Radio Garden America podcast. We do appreciate it. And, again, our regular show, you know when it is, uh, 8 to 10 Pacific Time, 11 to 1 Eastern Time Zone every Saturday. Uh, right here on uh, the Garden America Radio Network through BizTalk Streaming. For the entire crew, the entire crew is right here. John yeah. Begnasker, Tiger Palafox, I'm Thank Brian you. Main. Have a great – thank you. A great – Thank you for tuning into this edition of the Garden America Podcast on Tomatoes. Take care.